So I work with both natural language, um, how do we talk to the computer about music, and how do we interact through musical phrases, and the obvious domain there is improvisational jazz. So that's where my focus is going to be today, is the improvisational jazz. We're going to use Euterpia to look at that. Euterpia was originally created by Paul Hudak. I am the uh, current maintainer uh, and developer for that. Right now, um, I'm using a very slightly newer version than what's available on Hackage if you're to go and get it right this instant. Um, don't worry about that. It contains a very tiny experimental bug fix uh, that I'll be pushing out to the main repo soon. If you want to go and get it and have any problems setting it up, I'm happy to uh, you know, help dynamically with that after the talk during breaks and things. Uh, Euterpia is not available on Stack at this time. I would like to fix that. Um, I am not a Stack user. I am new to Stack, so consider this a request uh, for conversation on how I might accomplish that if any of, if any of you are um, quite familiar with Stack. All right. Um, we're going to start out with a very brief look at Euterpia, sort of the types it uses for dealing with music. But in a big picture sense, we're going to be looking at how to go from this. To something more like this. So, I mean, you could call that going from bad to good. You could also call that going from what you would present at a, um, like, acousmatic music venue to normal people. Um, so we're going to look, we're going to look at what's, what goes on in those question marks to make that kind of transition. Before we start that, though, um, let's talk about composition and performance. So. This is the way I have typically modeled this in every talk uh, I've ever given about this because I thought this is a really good way to break down the problem. After this, there's another slide that shows where it actually messes up a little bit. So this is an almost perfect <laughs> way to formalize the problem. Generally, you have a composer who is some decision-making entity uh, I'm, I'm a very AI person, so I think about things in terms of agents and, and entities and things. So we, we have this agent that is producing a score, and a score is an abstract piece of music. It tells you which notes to play. It doesn't tell you how to play them exactly. There's no exact mapping from those symbols to sound. There are a lot of steps left. That score then goes to a performer or a musician or whatever term you'd like. That's the person that takes the piece of paper and interacts with an instrument to realize that score. That person has decisions to make, um, how to articulate different things on the instrument, when to speed up and slow down the tempo a little bit, you know, adding feel to this otherwise pretty blocky, lifeless score. Then uh, we go to the instrument, which is typically reactive. I mean, normally, normally uh, instruments don't decide things for themselves, we are in an era where that is changing. Um, but as far as I'm going to be concerned today, an instrument is something where you know you you push a button or blow into it, and it has a pretty predictable response, and we get sound from that. Euterpia deals with two kinds of output that are relevant to this. Um, we can either deal with MIDI output, which is kind of on the left side of that dashed blue line, and then delegate everything on the right side of the dashed blue line to other software. That's what we'll be doing today. Uh, we will be sending messages like start a pitch at this time, stop a pitch at that time, to an external synthesizer that does the actual sound synthesis. Euterpia does also support uh, creating actual sound, but not in real time. Um, it can only render WAV files offline. Now, I was talking about that I'm moving in the direction of improvisational jazz. This is not how improvisational jazz works. Um, in improvisational jazz, 
we kind of get rid of the composer performer distinction. Um, obviously, there's somebody that creates the abstract score, which is also called the lead sheet. But sometimes it's as simple as a bunch of musicians getting together and saying, okay, let's play over a 2-5-1 progression in G major. You know, that's, that's not really considered a compositional activity. So we have this very vague description of what we're all going to do. And then all of the musicians have a lot of decisions to make. They have to decide which notes to play when, how to play each one of those, and, you know, and then it goes through the same way of, of dealing with instruments. But the performer in improvisational music has a lot more to deal with. We're going to kind of cheat a little bit with that. We're going to treat a performer in the improvisational jazz sense as kind of a real-time composer. Um, Uterpia does have a way of distinguishing sort of performance features from compositional features. And I don't really want to get into that today, so we're going to sort of stick with the idea of an, imp uh, an improvising musician is a real-time composer. They're, they're creating the collection of notes that could be rendered as a score if you, if you chose to, but they're creating that in real time so we can also pipe it out to an instrument in real time. Here is sort of the Euterpia cheat sheet. Um, Euterpia represents music as a tree. So at the bottom of the tree for the leaves, we have two kinds of leaf nodes. Something is either a note or it is a rest. Both of these things have some amount of time. So we either are playing a sound for some amount of time or waiting for some amount of time. Now you'll notice, uh, let's see, is my mouse showing up here? Yeah. You'll notice we have this type variable in A. Uh, the best way to think about that is that is where pitch information goes. You can put other information there too, but for the moment, just think that that's where, that's where pitch information goes. What information you have affects the type for music further down. So if we're only storing pitch, then we'll have um, a music pitch or a music abs pitch, which is what we'll be using a lot today. Um, abs pitch is short for absolute pitch. If you're a musician, these are also called pitch numbers. It's the idea that we can map uh, frequency to a collection of integers that essentially correspond to keys on a piano. So middle C is pitch number 60. Um, and then, you know, C sharp up from that is pitch 61 and so on. We have some shorthands for durations that I'll be using in the examples today, and we have some uh, shorthands for creating leaf notes and putting things together. So I can use the lowercase note function to create a note, lowercase rest to create a rest. Line creates a melody. If we take a list of music values, we can stick them together sequentially so that they play one after another. There's also another one not shown on here called chord that basically does the same thing, but stacks them all vertically so that they all start playing at the same time. We are not going to be making too much use of the music pitch type. I'm going to start with it just because it's real easy, but very quickly we're going to move into music abs pitch because it's really good for working with lists of numbers and um, Modeling interactive jazz is a very interactive, or sorry, a very um, list of numbers kinds of thing. All right. This is what it looks like when you're creating very simple music manually in Uterpia. I'm not going to play these because these are real simple. We'll hear much more interesting things in a minute. But I have a C, an E, and a G, and I can put them together sequentially. I can put them together in in some combination. Actually, there is a typo in this slide. This here, boy, that slipped past me for a long time. That should be an equal sign. If you make that an equal sign, then you get the figure uh, corresponding to that. Equals, uh, colon equals colon is the one that says put these things together uh, in parallel to make a chord. As is shown right here, these actually both produce the um, something very similar to the thing on the top. 
Okay, so let's say we start with something real simple. We have we have four notes here. This is what that sounds like. All right. One of the nice things about Euterpia is that we can manipulate simple things like that into much larger, much more complex things. So we have a function called transpose, which lets us um, shift a music value up or down in in pitch. So if I transpose something up three, I'm saying take all of those notes and their pitches, move that up three steps on the piano. Okay, still pretty simple. Now let's get a couple of other functions in there. We have invert, which means to flip something upside down on the pitch axis. Uh, if you do that on uh, sort of arbitrary music values where you haven't chosen the pitches correctly, that can have very uh, interesting um, results. Uh, in, it, combining something with an inversion of itself is a very easy way to kind of go down the atonal mishmash uh, route of things, but, but you know, it's interesting. Um, retrograde is a little nicer. That just means play it backwards. So here we're going to play the thing we just heard twice then we're going to hear its inversion, then we're going to hear its retrograde. Okay. OK, now we can layer this. So here's that colon equals colon thing actually being used correctly. So we are going to infinitely construct a music structure where we have what you just heard repeating after itself in parallel with the same thing played a bit slower. This is kind of like a technique called um, phase compositions. Um, in a phase composition, though, you usually do a very tiny tempo offset, and you hear these things kind of slowly come in and out of sync. This is a big tempo change between the two parts, so it's actually going to sound like interesting rhythmic textures instead. So, so far we have been on the, the left side of that composition performance figure that I showed you. Let's look at what happens if we do some work on the other side. So, I have a custom performance algorithm that I can put this through that, that cleans up how some of those notes are happening. You, you notice there were a lot of sort of like double hits on notes where it goes like da-da. Maybe we want to clean those up. Or go to the next slide. Thank you, computer. Now we'll slow the whole thing down a little bit, put it through a nice synthesizer. Very amped, yeah, very nice. And this is what happens, uh, or what happened, when I took that and decided to jam over it. Um, so this is about 50% computer, 50% me. notes that we produced in the previous things that I played, they actually kind of imply a chord progression. Um, and it sounds completely different if you put it through a different synthesizer. So I also played the same value through some crazy ring modulated analog synthesizer. And you can get something that doesn't resemble the original score very much. So even though I'm sticking on the sort of composition side of that figure, I don't want to diminish the importance of the performance side and the effect that it can have as evidenced by things like this. All right.
right, let's get into numbers. So we're going to be using numbers from here on out. Another way that we could write those same simple structures that we saw is to say note 60 quarter note followed by note quarter note 64 followed by note half note 67. So um, this lets us use numbers for pitches. If you don't know what pitch number 67 is, that's totally okay. Um, just accept that the numbers being used are correct. Um, and the nice thing about this is, uh, yes? Octaves, uh, I'm sorry, I don't. Oh, yes, it is. Thank you. Yes, that is that is the wrong way around. I have copious typos in this, apparently. Um, to add perhaps a little bit of an explanation for this, I've been getting up at 4 a.m. almost every day for a while because this is coming on the back of another conference. So thank you. <laughs> I thought I had all of these worked out, but apparently not. Yes, it should be. It should be note 64 quarter note. I do have a version of these slides online. I will fix these things uh, in the ones that are publicly available. Sorry about that. Now, the nice thing about working with numbers instead of that pitch type is we can start to work with randomness. So this is our first little baby step towards getting uh, that jazz stuff. Improvisational jazz is not the same each time. We need non-determinism, and we get that through use of uh, random generators. So I'm starting with a random generator with seed five here. I'm generating an infinite sequence of random numbers between pitch 50 and pitch 85. And then I am mapping the note function across all of those, lining it together to make a melody. And we get, we get this. So we're back at the weird, experimental, interesting music level. Um, but you know, at least if we change the seed, we get something completely different. It's so good you want to hear it again. Uh, now, if we want to actually start modeling sort of good decisions in music, um, a very critical element of that is choosing from lists or sets of options. Um, we don't want to just choose uniformly at random from all the pitches we have available. We don't want completely random durations. They're typically finite collections of things from which it's good to choose at a given point in time. So we have a little choose function here that does just that. We take a list of things, uh, a random generator, and we'll, we'll pick one of them and return a new generator. We can then use this to create a random randomized melody walking around through the collection of pitches that we've given it. Now this is very parameterized, so we can control the collection of pitches. We can also control the durations that we get to pick from. Um, and we can control a threshold at which something becomes a rest. This is a trick that I've started to use heavily in the algorithmic music that I produce. Um, it's very easy to get a nice kind of syncopated, varied volume kind of thing going on if you randomly select the volume out of the range that it's given and then make a decision on that. If it's below a threshold, make it a rest. Where you put that threshold affects the texture of the music. Uh, let's see. So let's listen to what, we, what happens if we take this approach of picking things randomly from lists, lists of pitches, lists of durations, uh, and using this threshold approach to deciding whether we have a note or a rest. And we're going to produce two, two lines. One is going to be sort of a treble line, and the other one is going to be bass. They're going to sound very different because in addition to changing the seed, we are also changing the parameters a lot. So the high line, uh, mel one here, has many more pitches pick from. It's got a much wider range and the bass line using this other set of pitches up here is very controlled. I'll explain that after we listen to it. Wait, 
well if you could hear the bass. Um, you would hear that the bass is uh, it's playing a lot of roots. Um, it's playing some fifths. This is important to giving a sense of key. If, if I let both of those parts use the same big pitch distribution that the melody is using, um, it would sound much more chaotic. So an important thing here is, one, we're choosing from collections of things instead of just sort of wandering around through the entire space of options, and two, we are choosing those collections of things based on the role in the music. Uh, this one might come out better. This is basically the same thing, but not jazzy. So that's, that's essentially the same algorithm. I just changed the seeds, changed the distribution slightly. Um, and we get something that sounds kind of like that, um, the, that annoying aquatic level in uh, is it Donkey Kong, I think. The one with the swordfish. OK. Now the next step we need to take, if we're going to be doing actual interactive jazz is, is musicians in jazz they do not stay in the same key like that if we just let that continue playing um, it would sound kind of boring because it's it's all in the same key it's all very very same this is not what we do in jazz uh, the key changes it changes a lot and we need some way to handle that so what that means is that our collection of things that we are choosing from is going to change over time. So here I'm modeling this as we're going to be playing over a list of scales. So for non-musicians, a scale is a music theoretic concept that just tells you which keys on the piano are okay to play at a given point in time. If I'm in C major, it's the white keys. Um, if I'm in C minor, some of those white keys become black keys. So we have a list of scales and we know how long to play each one of them for. This is very similar to the type of information that jazz musicians get when they are, uh, when they are actually improvising. And we're going to take our random generator course. And then our first step is we're going to figure out that new collection of things that we want to pick from for the melody. So the melody had, uh, had a, a fixed range of things. We need to adjust that based on the key. We also need to find for the bass the same thing. We need to find, um, we're gonna do a bossa nova bass in this one, so it's gonna be a little more, a little more deterministic. Um, a bossa nova bass, well, you'll, you'll recognize it when you hear this, assuming you can. Um, it's, ba it's based around the root and fifth of the scale. Um, in music, uh, fifth means four or seven. <laughs> So if that confuses you, um, yes. <laughs> so we're going to, once we figured out those two pitches for the bass in the current context, we split the generator because our, our random melody algorithm consumes its generator. And we need to be able to return a generator to, for the next iteration of this, this algorithm. We construct the bass pattern uh, using some little Utopia functions like we saw previously. We construct the melody using the random melt function that we already defined. And then we assign some instruments. So, here's what this sounds like over one particular set of keys. So we're gonna do E flat major, F minor, C minor, and these are just gonna cycle and repeat. So that's actually not too far off that first thing that I played you at the start of the talk, right? We're, we're getting pretty close um, with like 20 lines of code. Not bad. Uh, of course, there were no chords in that. If I were to add chords, um, 
I'll give you an example with some simple deterministically added chords where we basically go, okay, the scale is here on the piano and I'm going to pick the root, third, fifth, and seventh. No musician picks pitches this way, but it helps add, add some harmony to help you interpret the music when you're listening to it. Um, but we can also randomize the lead sheet. So if I randomly generate scales, we can get something that sounds like this. So now we have an infinite elevator music generator. <laughs> That's one of the great things that I like about this is I'll, I'll make something and be like, wow, it does this in 20 lines of code. Somebody else will come along and be like, you've done an infinite something something generator and always just kind of like really deflates <laughs> what that is. Like, wow, you just wrote a uh, bad video game music generator. Congrats. <laughs> uh, but seriously, we, we, can, we can do better with this. Now at this point, I'm going to stop showing actual code because the way that we bridge the rest of that gap from what you just heard to what you heard at the beginning of the talk, the difficulty kind of goes up a little bit and that goes boom. Um, still, the same principles apply. So what were we really doing in that, uh, in, in that um, set of code that we were looking at before? Well. It was all rolled into one function technically, but we could split that out into, into, into smaller functions, right? We could have a function that generates the baseline. We could have a function that generates the melody. We already split that out. We could have a function that generates the chords, and then we could have this sort of master function that rolls it all together and regulates where we are in the lead sheet. So can we simply do this? Okay, I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you vote because the answer is yes. Um, I think we can absolutely do this. And I have a, um, a framework that models jazz like this and it's, and it's very successful. Um, with a small caveat, of course. Um, what exactly the context is, is very important. Um, you know, the, the model is simple at a high level, but when you get down into the weeds, we need to worry about what does that context data type look like? What do we need to worry about? Um, and in fact, we're in, in the things that I just showed you, we were ignoring a very crucial piece of context, and that is the musician's internal state. Uh, we need to respond not just to changes in the lead sheet, changes in the scale that we're, that we're at currently. We also need to model planning behavior. Um, part of the reason why the things I played you sounded good is because the range allowed was still relatively small. If I allowed that marimba line to go over the in, like a really big range, it would sound very choppy. So an example of internal state that we need to model would be something like, where am I on this instrument so that I can narrow my selections for the next note that I'm playing. This is the model that I've been working with, uh, summed up as a figure. So we divide the notion of a lead sheet, which is this very abstract composition, if, if you want to call it that, that um, that jazz musicians have access to, we divide that into segments. There are many ways that you can segment something like this. So you can do it purely based on when the key changes. You could do it at important uh, metrical features. You could do it at measure boundaries. Um, they don't always, uh, in reality, what might be considered a segment doesn't always line up perfectly with the key changes. It can be a bit more complex than that. We then model each musician as a function. And the musician is a function from context, both shared and internal, to what they play. And what everybody plays 
becomes part of the context for everybody else's next round of playing things. So this is also taking kind of a discrete model of things. Um, it could be argued that jazz musicians are much more continuous creatures, um, as hopefully most of us are as well. Uh, but we, the problem with making this model truly continuous is that there are, there are just sort of complexity issues associated with doing sort of a continuous analysis and generation. To balance the complexity and sort of modeling the cognitive process, this, this sort of d discrete within a reason approach is, uh, is what I found best so far. So we aggregate things over time a little bit, um, and then we make decisions for some amount of time. This is not totally unfounded. There is evidence uh, with jazz musicians that they do plan things in chunks. So one, the one popular model for this, this sort of thing are Markov chains, um, and the states for those are typically pitches. Those don't account for the idea that a jazz musician might have just planned out the next six notes that he or she is going to play. Uh, and the next time might plan the next two notes. It might, it might change. Um, you can use variable length Markov models for something like that, but um, generally I've found that those perform less well than, than this, this type of approach where we aggregate just a little bit, you know, over like a second or two and then um, plan for a second or two and aggregate again. Here's some examples of what we can get from using this approach. Is there any chance we can boost the volume for this just a little bit? There, that's a bit better. So that's some very ambient stuff. Um, that was using, uh, that, that is entirely um, algorithmically generated up all, you know, all the way through everything. The, the, the instruments are also um, also algorithms as far as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, so in other words, none of those notes were touched by me. Felici was also randomly gen generated. So all of those parts were having to dynamically adapt to what they were about to play as it as it comes. Um, the next one, I'm actually I'm actually going to save the audio on that because I want to give you a live performance of that one. Um, I do get a lot of questions on the name, so there is a definition for you. Uh, an ugly purse dog is is something that you are very likely to see at some point on the subways around here if you use them enough. Um, and yes, it is the dog that is ugly, not, not necessarily the purse. Uh, so I'll, I'll save that one and I'll, and I'll give you the live version in just a minute. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna break with my plan here. I'm gonna do the live version now since we're talking about that one. So remember I mentioned that Python thing? Well, a problem with taking the models that we've just looked at in Haskell with Euterpia, uh, a problem with taking that into the interactive domain is stability. Um, there should be nothing stopping that from being able to be a very nice uh, interactive system you know, hooked up, I, I would have to rewrite a bit of the back end to deal with accommodating, um, accommodating MIDI input. But unfortunately, at least at present, there is something in the chain of dependencies going all the way down to C libraries for Euterpia that will, will just periodically decide it doesn't want to talk to the MIDI device. This is not typically a problem when you are only doing playback, but if you want to make something where 
you're going to say test it with real musicians, they don't tend to take too kindly to a bunch of like port error, port error, port error, port error, and then you have to restart the system. If that were to be fixed at some point, if I can ever figure out where exactly that is coming from, because as far as I can tell, it is not within Utopia itself, then this could all be done in Haskell. But for the moment, it has to be done in Python. I literally ported the algorithms from Haskell into Python for this. Um, in the code for it, there's even still commented out Haskell code um, from, where I was, from where I was comparing things directly. So, Helps if I turn my input device on. That's a very good thing. Okay, and we're working. Perfect. All right. So this is ugly purse dog. All of the nice functional style modeling things that we've talked about in an interactive setting, so here we go. Boost volume a little bit. Ugly Purse Dog, the interactive version. Functional awesomeness in action. Alrighty. Uh, and I have to get back to the slides. Okay. Alright, so what were we doing there that we weren't doing before in the code I showed you? Well, the first thing is those solos were stateful. Um, that said, they are not very complex stateful solos. Really, the only thing that, uh, that those are storing as an internal state is, as I mentioned, where are we on the instrument right now? You know, if I'm up here on the instrument, I don't want to choose the next pitch down there, probably. Um, I probably want to pick something that's within some distance of where I am currently. There were two kinds of generative segments in those solos that you heard. 
one of them was directly parroting from me. So it was listening to my input, aggregating, as I mentioned, and then chopping out sections of it and doing kind of a recombinatory thing with that. It was also periodically adding in new, um, new uh, sections where it just generates the pitches ignoring what I did. Stateful in both cases though. The walking bass was a little bit more complicated than this, but this is sort of the core of how the walking bass worked. Um, you can think of a wa walking bass as a pathfinding strategy. It's, it's common that you want to arrive at a particular place in some number of beats. So if I'm in the key of C and I'm going to, um, I don't know, God forbid, F sharp major, um, I want to probably land on the root of that scale at the particular point in time when that key change occurs to make sure that it sounds good and it sounds like we're in the right key. The bass player has a very particular role to fill in that. Um, so we can model that as kind of pathfinding. There are many ways that you could do that. This is just one where we basically subdivide the problem. We pick a middle point to go to, then we pick middle points to go to within that. Uh, so I just showed you the interactive Python version. I think I'm approaching my time limit here. So no, no one heard it stop. And that one, the one you heard was better. Uh, so I will end there. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm very interested in getting Euterpia onto Stack. I've had many, many requests for that and just have not had time uh, to investigate that. I have also seen like 10 different versions of stack.yaml files that don't work for everybody and nobody can tell me why. So if you can tell me why, I'd like to know. <laughs> um, there's my website if you want to hear more crazy music. Uh, you can go to my SoundCloud and this talk and the materials for it are on the Euterpy website. If you go to the talks and tutorials, it's there and I will fix those couple of typos um, that you all caught uh, early on. So that's it. Uh, thank you.